HSBC, BP, Sky, they're all doing it. Going green to save the planet. But do all their environmental schemes work? Tonight, Dispatches reveals problems with carbon offsetting. We should not be doing it. In my view, it should simply be closed down. The difficulties of carbon labelling. It's taken years to get one label on one type of crisps. And the myth of carbon neutrality. It's very, very fashionable, but substance, I think, is seriously lacking. How many of the schemes to deal with our carbon footprint are just hot air? Travelling through Mexico. I've come here to visit a farm where some very special animals live. I've been told these are the animals that are helping save the planet. Here they are. The pigs that will help prevent climate disaster. Or rather, their shit will. How is pig shit meant to help save the planet from global warming? It's all about what's going on under here. I've been assured that this is totally safe, which is important because this liner is all that's preventing me from falling into two and a half million gallons of you know what. But it's also what's preventing several tons of methane from going up there every year. Pig muck gives off methane. Methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas and a major player in global warming. This tarpaulin traps the methane. The gas is then burnt off. Why does this matter? Because by capturing and burning off methane, this pig farm reduces the total amount of greenhouse gas warming the planet. And because we all share the Earth's atmosphere, Reductions in greenhouse gases made here can be sold to cancel out emissions created in, for example, the UK. Sending these savings around the globe is a process called offsetting. You're going to hear a lot about offsetting in this film. It's a bit of a buzzword at the moment. This Mexican project is offsetting for one of the biggest companies in Britain. BP. They use the pigs to offset the emissions from their customers' cars. On their website, BP told customers that trapping methane on farms in Mexico can cancel out the carbon dioxide from three quarters of a million cars each year. The average car in Britain drives around 5,700 miles a year, so the pigs are supposed to be capable of offsetting hundreds of millions of miles of car journeys. As I said, these are very special pigs. Carbon offsetting pigs. But we've been looking at BP's pig-based calculations. Those claims that they can offset the journeys of 750,000 cars seem a bit optimistic. These machines measure the methane as it passes along the pipes on its way to being burnt off. They reveal that the farms are not performing in the way BP hoped they would. BP are claiming their pig projects here in Mexico could offset the equivalent of three quarters of a million cars, but this equipment isn't clocking up anything like enough carbon credits to make that look like a realistic goal. It makes you wonder whether BP's claims are anything but green PR. It turns out these Mexican pigs are delivering less than half of the savings expected. And when we spoke to BP, they told us they've only bought enough carbon savings to offset or cancel out the emissions of 2,500 cars. That's a lot less than the three-quarters of a million figure on their website. Since we got in touch, that number has been removed. Perhaps even backing from one of the world's biggest companies can't guarantee success from Mexican pig muck. In a response, BP told us, the BP website communicated the total capacity of the projects to reduce CO2 emissions. 
We've only very recently become aware that the original overall capacity figure of 3 million tonnes, which was included in the description of this project, will not be reached. We're in the process of updating our website and other material to reflect this change and to communicate the total actual emissions reductions purchased during this first 12-month period. Back in the UK, I continued looking at offsetting. Pigs may not save the planet, but they're just one of the many schemes designed to get us out of trouble, to help us deal with our carbon footprint. The amount of carbon dioxide emitted by a person or product in a lifetime. Everything has a footprint. People, cars, factories, animals. Offsetting is supposed to help cancel out those carbon footprints. It ensures that someone else cuts their emissions on our behalf and helps us make that footprint as small as possible. Offsetting is certainly popular, but are the problems with pigs a one-off? Is offsetting a viable solution to climate change? Many of its devotees would claim that it is. Climate change is huge as an issue. It's the biggest problem probably that humanity has ever faced. If we're trying to reduce emissions as fast as we can, we have to find the very cheapest thing and the fastest thing and do that first. Anything else is an absolute dereliction of our duty to the environment. But offsetting also has its vocal critics. We think rather than change our own behaviour, we can pay someone else in the world, normally a poor person somewhere else in the world, a few pence, and if we can get them to change their behaviour, and that will allow us to carry on our carbon profligate lifestyles. Um, it helps us sleep at night. It, I mean, it stops us actually making real behavioural change in our own lives to genuinely help the future of our children. We should not be doing it. Uh, it should be, in my view, it should simply be closed down. In Britain, one of the most popular ways to offset our carbon footprint lies all around us in the countryside. Trees. I'm in Wales. This man believes his forest can help save the planet by cancelling out emissions. People pay him to offset their air travel using his trees. I deeply believe that trees can be a part of our strategy to address climate change. They, they're the only proven way that we have of actually physically withdrawing CO2 from the atmosphere, and they, they do that in a tremendously efficient way. Rue Hartwell specialises in dealing with flights. So how will these trees deal with my carbon footprint, for example, and the flights I've taken? I've taken about... Yeah. 14 flights, round-trip flights, yeah. in the last 12 months. Yeah. I want to offset the, the impact those flights mm. have had in terms of their carbon dioxide emissions. What can you do for me? We'll plant one tree for each individual flight that you take, so that would bring it up to 28 trees in total that we'd plant for you. And over the long term, the very long term, these trees would do the absorption work to clear up some of the mess that you've made. How much will you charge me for each one? £10 per tree. So that would be a cheque to you for £280 yes, for please. those flights? We want it to be easy to do, one tree, one flight. You make a mess, clear it up. Rue Hartwell isn't the only man providing offsets through trees. Big companies are also using trees as a way to cancel out their customers' carbon footprint. Computer giant Dell will plant trees for you to offset the emissions from a laptop computer. Carmaker Honda have also used trees, as do Avis. It seems like such a simple solution, but before I commit any money, I want to find out just a little bit more about how this whole thing works. It seems not everyone is as confident as Rue Hardwell when it comes to trees. Dr Kevin Anderson works at the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change. So what about if I plant a forest? Surely that's a good thing. Planting trees in itself is a good thing, it's for sustainability purposes, but to claim it as an offset, we do not know that over the next 30 to 100 years, those trees will remain there. They may well die and rot, or die and be burned. He's got a point. Trees could die, be cut down, any number of things could happen. 
We just don't know how long they'll stay standing. I put this to the man who believes in trees. A lot of people are saying a lot of bad things about offsetting yeah. carbon emissions with trees. Yeah. Yet you're basing your entire business plan on trees. I can't stand here and actually promise that all these trees will be here in 80 years. But what I can say is I've got complete confidence that they will be here. We are going to transfer ownership of this land to a charitable trust that exists solely to protect and ensure that these trees survive to maturity. Relying on trees means you have to be sure they'll stay in the ground and not die or burn down. Other than that, Wu Harwell's system is clear. If you take a flight, it pumps a new load of carbon dioxide out into the atmosphere, so you need to plant a new tree to take that carbon dioxide back. When it comes to cancelling out your carbon footprint, creating a new saving is very important. But when it comes to other offset companies, can you be sure they're actually putting new trees in the ground? This is Duncan McLaren from Friends of the Earth. He doesn't have much faith in schemes which use trees as a way of offsetting. When people buy offsets, they think literally that someone's going to go dig a hole in the ground, put in some saplings, those saplings are going to grow up into trees and in the process take carbon from the air. But he believes many have bought offsets even though their money has not planted new trees. What they've actually got is the right, if you like, to the uh, carbon absorption from trees that had been planted anyway. And the carbon that's been accumulated in the forest would have accumulated there anyway. So the people who are paying for it are rather being misled into the idea that something new and additional is happening as a result of them buying these offsets. So how common is this problem? Are people buying offsets from forests that would have existed anyway? I travel to Donkley Wood in Northumberland, a forest that provides carbon offsets to Britain's leading carbon offsetter, the Carbon Neutral Company, who've been in the business for 10 years. They give advice to Channel 4, among others, on their carbon footprint. On the Carbon Neutral Company's website, almost half the carbon-reducing projects are based on trees. The wood is owned by Bryn Dowson. This is his third wood. He sees them as a legacy he can give to the land and hopes the trees will remain here for a long time. He believes working with the Carbon Neutral Company raises awareness about climate change. He received £55,000 from the Carbon Neutral Company, in exchange for which they get the right to sell 20,000 tonnes of CO2 absorbed by the trees, which can be used to offset their customers' carbon emissions. However, this money was not his primary source of funding. That came from the Forestry Commission, a grant of £320,000. Would it have been possible to do it without carbon offsetting money? Do you, I mean, is it a necessity or is it just nice to have? It wasn't absolutely essential. That's the absolute truth. But it's fantastic that it is. I mean, it makes you do a better job. I mean, there are about 120 odd thousand trees on this site. Each one has to be maintained. Each one gets weeded every summer. There are deer fences and gates to be maintained. And every year, for whatever reason, some trees die. And I have to replace the trees that die in order to maintain a certain stocking level, a certain number of trees on the property, because, of course, that's what all the carbon offsetting is about. If the number of trees goes down, the carbon offset value goes down. The money is going to a good cause, there's no doubt about that. But as Friends of the Earth say, for emissions to be cancelled out, new trees need to be planted as a result of the money paid by people wanting to offset. But at Donkey Wood, the carbon neutral company's money was not essential for the planting of the forest. It would have existed anyway. So it casts doubt on whether it should be used as a source of 20,000 tonnes of carbon offsets, enough to cancel out the yearly carbon footprint of almost 4,500 people. We asked the carbon neutral company for a response on this point. They told us... It is possible that up to 70% of the establishment costs of Mr Dowson's wood could be from the Forestry Commission and the remainder from carbon finance. The remainder is necessary, like the last piece of funding for a project. 
When we contract with a partner, we require them to confirm that the funds are additional. We've shown you the pigs that allow us to drive, the trees that mean we can fly, but these great ideas to cancel out our carbon footprint don't seem to be working quite as advertised. Next, we discover a big problem in the science at the heart of offsetting. We've been looking at how companies are trying to tackle the world's carbon footprint. We've seen that offset projects using pig manure and trees have problems in delivering sufficient cuts in carbon. But what happens if you can't even work out how big this footprint's supposed to be? Let's take one of the fastest growing worries in terms of global warming, air travel. Everyone agrees it increases the effects of climate change. The problem is, no one can say by how much. I went to see the people whose business is based on putting a figure on how much damage flights do to the environment and selling us a way to deal with it. One of Britain's largest offsetting companies, Climate Care. They invest in projects which cut emissions going into the atmosphere. They sell the carbon savings to companies like Powergen, British Airways, the Cooperative Bank and The Guardian. How would they calculate how much damage my air travel is doing to the planet? I should add that I'd be in good company. Climate Care offset the flights of the Queen's latest trip to the US. I've made quite a number of flights in yeah. the last year, 13, 14. We can help you calculate the carbon impact of the air travel and right. then we can sell you carbon offsets which will help fund green energy projects around the world and compensate for your impact. Very good. Right, let's get started. So what's the first one? From Moscow to Yakutsk, Delhi, Delhi, Dubai, Geneva, Edinburgh, London to Adelaide. Uh, the London to Adelaide is definitely the longest five flight. Five tonnes. Uh, yeah, over five tonnes. Okay. They totted up the emissions from my flights. In total, Climate Care's sums say my flying is responsible for nearly 19 tonnes of carbon dioxide. Not good news for the planet. Emissions from my air travel alone are four times bigger than an average person's yearly carbon footprint. So what's Climate Care's answer? They say if I pay them £140, I'll be buying offsets which will cancel out the emissions from my flights. But there's a problem here. Climate Care are not the only people offering to offset my carbon footprint. And unfortunately, no one can agree what size my footprint is. Take the longest flight, London to Adelaide return, 32,000 kilometers. I discovered that three of the biggest offsetters in the market can't agree how much carbon dioxide this return flight creates. Climate Care say just over five tonnes. Britain's biggest offsetter, the Carbon Neutral Company, say around three and a half tonnes. And there's even an estimate of 12 tonnes from a German offsetting company called Atmosphere. So here's the problem. I'm trying to reduce the impact of my air travel, but how can I when no one agrees about the effect the flight has on the environment? It all seems very contradictory. George Marshall works at COIN, a charity dedicated to providing the public with information on climate change. He's been looking at exactly how each offsetting company calculates the carbon dioxide emitted by a flight. We looked at over 30 calculators that were online. Once you started looking at flights and consumption, they started going way, way, way apart. And for flights, we found a variation of up to sevenfold in the results that we were getting. So, what's going on? The answer, it would seem, lies in the clouds. With a mysterious bit of science called a multiplier. Aircraft fumes contain greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide. 
These fumes do more damage when released by a plane in the stratosphere than when they're emitted on the ground. This means in order to work out how much warming it's causing up there, you need to increase or multiply the effect the carbon dioxide's having. Unfortunately, no one can agree what size the multiplier, as it's called, should be. Some offset companies say it should be three. Some, like Climate Care, say two. Others just ignore it. I asked Climate Care's Mike Mason to explain this confusion. Why can't these offsetting companies agree? It's not the uncertainty in science. There is uncertainty in science, but it's not the uncertainty in the science as much as the challenge of interpreting the science in a way that consumers understand. Because the reality is that the effects are complex. And there's an economic consideration. The honest fact is offsetters must find a price that people are prepared to pay. If you say, well, I'm unclear about my interpretation of the science for reasons that are best known to me, so I will massively ramp up the, if you like, the safety factor. That might give you a clearer position in terms of offsetting the emissions. But if what you do is you push it out of the reach of many people, so very, very fewer people buy it, you haven't actually done the planet a favour. We've seen there's little agreement on what size our carbon footprint is. No one agrees on the science behind the impact of our flights. But even more confusing is that climate care have two different prices for the same flight. One of their blue chip clients is British Airways. So if you buy your offsets on the British Airways website, the climate care logo pops up. Take that London to Adelaide return flight one more time. Through the BA website, Climate Care tells me it creates nearly four tonnes of carbon dioxide, and I'll have to pay just over £27 to offset it. But if I go to Climate Care Direct, I get a totally different answer, saying it emits much more carbon dioxide and it'll cost £12 more to offset. So I'm being charged different prices for the same flight by the same company. Why is the price different? Remember that multiplier, the bit of science used to take account of the effect flights have on the stratosphere, the one that no one can agree on? Well, BA have decided that until that science is cleared up, they won't use a multiplier. They don't take account of the impact of emissions at high altitude. How do their offsetting company, Climate Care, explain this? One of your customers, British Airways, who offer offsets to their passengers, provided by you, charge less. Well, I've argued with them quite strongly that they shouldn't. And I genuinely believe that they shouldn't do that. Their line is something that you perhaps ought to ask them about. But where does that leave you? Doesn't it undermine your brand to sort of... If I'm honest, I'd prefer that they did it with a global warming multiplier. Um, but at the same time, we have a task of persuading companies, of leading them forwards. And there is an old saying, you know, more flies are caught with sugar than are caught with vinegar. The problem here is that there's no clear science. If you buy your offsets direct from Climate Care to be safe, they'll charge you for the effect of aircraft fumes high in the sky. Another of Britain's leading offsetters, the carbon neutral company, however, don't use this multiplier, just like British Airways. We asked both companies for their response on this point. The carbon neutral company told us, Our emissions calculator is based on DEFRA emissions factors. There is an ongoing debate about such factors. We believe it's better to follow an endorsed position in our home market rather than an arbitrary number. We will consider other factors in the future. BA said... British Airways believes it's vital to investigate and address the effect on climate change of non-CO2 emissions from aircraft. There is at present no scientific consensus on the effect of non-CO2 emissions and we believe the use of carbon equivalent multipliers is therefore inappropriate. 
We note the government's new CO2 footprint calculator supports this view. Its calculator for air travel does not include a multiplier. So by now I'd been faced with a range of offsetting companies who'd asked me to put my faith in them to cancel out the carbon emissions from my flights. But they'd all given me different prices. I didn't know who to trust. By now, I was completely confused. So what do I know so far? Pigs have problems, trees are troublesome, and flying is really confusing. So as a concerned citizen who still has a car, where can I put my money to save the world? One option is to buy offsets created by renewable energy, like projects which generate power from wind or water. More and more offsetting companies are moving into renewable energy. This project in Bulgaria creates electricity from running water. That's better for the planet than getting electricity from things like coal-fired power stations. The carbon neutral company buys offsets from this independently verified project to pass them on to their corporate clients so that they can cancel out their carbon footprint. The carbon neutral companies say their cash enabled the projects in Bulgaria to go ahead. Is this the case? It's an important question because they sell offsets from the project to Sky. This allows Sky to market themselves as one of the most climate conscious media companies in the world. We went to see if Sky's money was really making a difference to the world's carbon footprint. The project manager for the plant is Vladislav Tretskov. He thinks the project is doing its bit to save the planet. We save to the environment about 11,000 tons a year carbon dioxide. And it's an ecologically clean project. And it's very, very good business also. Well, that's great. Renewable energy is undeniably a good thing. But what about our test? Does he need the carbon neutral company's money? Is it needed for the investment? Is it required in order to make the business work? No, it's not. It's not required. It's an additional, it's an additional effect from the, from the project. It's good to have it as an effect. Let's just hear that again. No, it's not. It's not required. So, if we heard that right, Mr. Tredkov's plant may be good for the environment, but he didn't need the carbon neutral company's money. So, in this case, is the carbon neutral company's money key to reducing the world's carbon footprint? Mr. Tredkov seems to be saying no. We asked the carbon neutral company about this. They insisted that their money was needed. It increased the financial performance of the project. Mr. Tvedskov's company also got in touch. They said we got it wrong. The carbon neutral company's money was critical to the establishment of the plant. So there was one more place to go if we wanted to clear this up. The bank in Sofia, Bulgaria, that financed the project in the first place. Did they agree with the carbon neutral company's version of events? The bank said the carbon money didn't matter, that it was not included in the project's business case, and that getting that money was not a prerequisite to the bank financing the project. They later elaborated, stating that the revenues from the carbon credits were assessed, but the bank does not base lending decisions on trade with carbon credits only or predominantly. Revenues from carbon credits were not included in the bank's financial analysis. So where does this leave Sky? Our findings cast doubt on whether the money that Sky pays to the carbon neutral company is actually offsetting their carbon footprint. Yet again, it seems hard to find out with any certainty exactly how offset money is helping to protect the planet. We asked Sky for a response. They said, The investment in the Katunsi project accounts for approximately 12.5% of the offset Sky has purchased. In addition to assurances of the quality of the investment received from the carbon neutral company, we've taken advice that the project meets the voluntary carbon standard. We regularly review our approach, and if it's shown that any offsets do not meet their claimed environmental contribution, they'll be replaced. 
The carbon neutral company told us they were proud of their achievements. They said... Carbon offsetting has a vital role to play in reducing global greenhouse gas emissions. We work with 150 projects and demonstrate through independent monitoring and verification that they reduce greenhouse gas emissions now and will continue to do so into the future. The issue that keeps cropping up here is that offsetting companies don't work to a single set of standards which means that a green consumer doesn't know where to turn. Concerned with this lack of regulation, the government's promised to introduce a standard governing the type of projects offsetting companies can use to create carbon reductions. They produced this consultation document, which has been met with a fair bit of consternation within the offsetting industry. This proposed standard could mean that all offsetting projects, whether they be trees or wind farms, need to have been approved by the EU or the UN. This would rule out many of the projects currently used by both the carbon neutral company and climate care. We asked Mike Mason about the proposed standard. There is no agreed seal of approval, kite mark, call it what you will, quality control standards for a carbon offset. Is that a problem? We do really need some standardisation, but it has, and we do need some consensus, but it needs to be careful, it needs to be thought through, and it needs to be something that will help build the industry and not shut it down. The carbon neutral company said that they are now listed as an offsetter on the DEFRA website since some of their projects do meet the government's proposed standard. I started this whole process trying to find the right way to offset, but I don't think I've found it. I've been confronted by different prices, different science, even different philosophies. This industry definitely needs a defined standard. We've seen some of Britain's biggest companies are using a huge variety of schemes to improve their green credentials, but our investigation has raised serious questions about some of them. So where else can you turn if you want to tackle the size of your carbon footprint? Save us. The West End of London has a pretty big carbon footprint. Lights blazing, cars belching fumes, and in the middle of it all, a brand new attraction. Environmentally friendly entertainment. We are the first ever carbon neutral variety show. Thank you all for coming tonight. Carbon neutral, it's the latest green buzzword. I met the organisers to find out just why they're doing this. We felt that we could make a difference and we can put a thought in people's mind that maybe they can do something as well. These promoters are hoping to completely neutralise the impact they have on the environment. They're doing it by reducing emissions, using low lighting and minimum transportation for food and drink. And what they can't reduce, they offset. Hopefully people will be titillated by what we do and also think twice about the impact that they're having on the planet. It's hard to doubt the good intentions of these green enthusiasts. But we've already found reducing your carbon footprint can be difficult. For a start, it's hard to work out how big it is. And there are question marks over the clever schemes companies have developed to reduce it. But this isn't stopping business from wanting a piece of the green action. One of the biggest impacts we have on the environment is through our consumption here on the high street. And an increasing number of retailers are trying to convince us that by buying from them, we're being green. M&S say they'll be carbon neutral by 2012. HSBC say they already are.
But as ever in this area, there are the doubters. In this case, Dieter Helm, Professor of Energy Policy at Oxford University. It's very, very fashionable for big companies who are actually engaged in pretty polluting activities to somehow embrace the slogan that they've gone carbon neutral and so we can go on consuming their products knowing that actually we're not damaging the environment. If only it was that simple. The idea that they can assuage their consciences by buying some offsets in an international market as a substitute for cleaning up their own act. This is um, uh, you know, good, perhaps, PR and publicity, but substance, I think, it, it, it is seriously lacking. And it's not just Professor Helm who has doubts about carbon neutrality. The government itself thinks the term is too tricky to use. This is the government's consultation document on offsetting. It strongly suggests that companies shouldn't describe themselves as carbon neutral because of the complexities in calculating business carbon emissions. So how fair are these criticisms? I was on my way to see the largest company in Britain claiming to have gone carbon neutral, HSBC. They've decided to reduce emissions and bought offsets spending two and a half million pounds last year in the process. Carbon neutrality is something we aspire to achieve and, and we believe we've done everything uh, to do that. So how do they feel about the government's difficulties with the term carbon neutral? If government decides that carbon neutrality is a term that shouldn't be used, I think it'll be a shame because in many ways I think it has caught the public's imagination. And if it leads to companies saying this is just too difficult, it's too regulated, so I won't bother, I think that will be a shame. Whatever the question marks over the term, the chance of getting a slice of the green market will mean big business is going to keep developing ways of marketing themselves as green. A big choice we all have to make is where we buy our energy from. Over a quarter of the UK's carbon dioxide emissions come from the energy we use in our homes, like lights, kettles and boilers. No wonder all the energy companies are presenting themselves as the right choice for the green consumer. Take this ad from British Gas. But because of the cleaner energy sources we use, our electricity has the lowest carbon emissions of any major supplier. And many of the energy companies advertise green tariffs. These are ways of ensuring that the energy you buy comes from renewable sources like wind power rather than from a coal-fired power station. We thought we'd look at these tariffs in a bit more detail. We commissioned some exclusive research from a leading environmental consultant. He's one of the few people who actually understands the green electricity market. I'm off to Wiltshire to meet him and find out exactly what you're getting when you sign up to a climate-friendly tariff. Andy Kerr is a specialist in the financial aspects of climate change policy. We asked him to look at green products offered by some of the large energy companies. He found that when you sign up, you get a promise that the electricity you use is matched with electricity from a renewable source. But some of the companies don't tell you that they're only getting this electricity from renewable sources because the government has obliged them to. The companies really ought to be providing the basic information about what it has to do legally and where your particular tariff fits in with this. They ought to really say, we are having to do this anyway. They're being extremely cheeky here. So what difference are you making by signing up? Let's take PowerGen's Go Green tariff. It says that if you switch to their tariff, you'll be doing your bit for the environment. But what does that mean? Well, this tariff costs nothing extra, and that might be the key point. If you're getting something for nothing, then you might question what exactly it is you're getting. You, as a consumer, you're not actually getting anything additional that would not otherwise be produced, and I think that ought to be clear. In so all cases, whether you pay extra for your green tariff or not, it's never mentioned that we're already paying for renewable electricity through our energy bills. Every consumer, as I understand, is paying this through their energy bills anyway. Currently, every single household is, is paying something like £7 a year towards renewable energy. And it's very rarely put explicitly that that's what's going on. 
It looks like electricity companies aren't really taking this very seriously. Some of the tariffs they offer are very good. Some are pretty much an irrelevance. They're a, they're a useful tag and no more. We shouldn't tar the entire industry with the same brush. I think we do need to focus on the individual company and the individual tariff, because some companies have good and bad tariffs together, and say, can we, uh, as, a, as a consumer, as an individual, can we say, that's the one I want, and focus on that particular one. Powergen told us that Go Green raises awareness of the availability of green tariffs and that if demand for the tariff outstrips the level they have to source by law, then they would be supporting additional green generation by meeting that demand. We're all being asked to make green choices. What's becoming clear is that we don't know if these choices are actually reducing our carbon footprint. And another problem is knowing how big that footprint is. But a new government-backed scheme has laboured long and hard on the footprint issue. And may have the answer on a packet of cheese and onion crisps. This might look like a packet of crisps, but it's actually the government's next big environmental idea. Because on the back is a label, a bit like nutrition information, but it tells you how much carbon was used getting this packet to the shops. And then the crisps into my mouth. It's a way of informing the choices we make as consumers. The label on Walker's cheese and onion crisps is a new idea from the Carbon Trust. They get £80 million a year from the government to turn us into a low carbon economy. But as ever with these ideas, there are problems. First, the science. How can we be sure how much carbon we're using? Does this mean someone's finally cracked how to measure those troublesome carbon footprints? Professor Gareth Edwards-Jones is a scientist who specialises in the carbon impact of food production chains. First of all, is it possible to know the carbon footprint of a potato? The science is really uncertain. We can see very simply how much diesel is used in taking a potato from a farm to the shop, and some people, food miles, people talk about that, and that's a very easy thing to do. The sort of next level of complexity is to look at how much energy goes into making the potato, so how much energy goes into making the fertiliser, to run in the tractors, to bring in any irrigation, and then you add that onto the food miles, so that's the second level of complexity. And then the third level of complexity, where science is only just really finding things out, is looking at the emissions that come from the farm itself. Soil itself is full of organic matter. And what happens is the little beasts that live in the soil, the bacteria, the fungi, they break down that, because that's what they live on. And as they do that, they release carbon dioxide. So we know a lot about transport, we know a lot about energy going into the farm, but understanding that farm ecosystem and the relation to the crop and the soil, we're really only starting to unravel that. But these problems with the science have not deterred the carbon trust. They've put a label on two types of Boots shampoo. Innocent smoothies are also involved, but they've decided not to use the label on their bottles just yet. And it isn't going to stop there. The government also wants to roll out the scheme across all grocery products. But it may be a bit more complicated than they'd have us believe from the headlines. Green author Chris Goodall believes the whole labelling idea is wildly impractical. It's not going to happen. A typical large supermarket has about 100,000 items in them. It's taken years of involvement between the carbon trusts and the makers of Walker's crisps to get uh, one label on one type of crisps. This is an enormous project, incredible scale. Nobody yet has any idea of how complex and how difficult and expensive it's going to be. We asked the carbon trust to comment on our findings. They told us that the pilot study for Walker's crisps took two months. In the case of potatoes, we use the latest expert research and primary data to undertake calculations. Furthermore, we've established an independent technical advisory group and have run a number of detailed pilot studies. We've worked with Walker's and its parent company PepsiCo on a range of different carbon reduction projects since 2004. None of the schemes we've examined is actually doing the planet any harm. But are they a dangerous diversion from the real choices we have to make? Kevin Anderson certainly thinks so. Ultimately, we need to go at a carbon-controlled diet. 
And if you're going to go on a diet, you can't ask someone else to reduce their calorie intake for you. That's not how dieting works. We have to make those changes. We have to reduce our calorie, our carbon intake or emissions ourselves. Many offsetters will give general advice on green issues, but one of them takes the celebrity approach to spreading the green word. Two, three, four. Save the world. They're the planet-saving organisation of the rich and famous. This summer, temperatures will rise all over the world. Global cool. Pointless celebrity vehicle or serious movement for change. To find out, I was visited at home by head of policy, Fanny Calder. Come and look at my house. She was going to explain Global Cool's message of personal change by showing me how my home could be greener. This is a very beautiful window, but it's not double glazed. So you are letting energy pour out through those gaps you have. Their aim over the next 10 years is to get 1 billion people, including me, I suppose, to come on board to pledge to reduce their personal emissions. You've got this set to 20. Now, 18 is perfectly comfortable, and if you reduce by that much and keep it like that all winter while it's on, that's going to save you one or two tonnes of CO2 a year. But isn't all this a bit pointless? The emissions from one long-haul flight would dwarf any savings made by the changes she was suggesting. I was about to ask this serious question, but alarmingly, she was making a beeline for my bathroom. OK, well, the main thing in the bathroom is if you can take showers instead of bars for a year, then you'll cut your emissions by about a quarter of a tonne of carbon. So it's really worth it. I don't understand. How does water use carbon dioxide? How does that...? Well, water, the, reason, the way it gets here is that it's pumped. And, and the pumps are run by...? Electricity. Right. Oh, and also not flushing the loo too often. I mean, you've just had a pee, you don't need to flush the loo. Well, I did when you were coming, because I didn't want it, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> How much of a difference actually do these little things make? Because to me, it seems like just, you know, a tiny amount. The average carbon dioxide emissions from a household in the UK is about 11 tonnes of CO2 a year. Okay. Now, if you do all the things that I've been talking about, or a lot of them regularly, you can easily get two or three tonnes off that. You're not the one for me. Down to you to find ways to decrease your carbon footprint. Global Cool are using the power of celebrities to publicise a message about climate change. We're being asked to respond, to do something green. We found many companies asking us to choose them to prove our green credentials, to give them our money. But our journey shows you should probably treat the promises they make with a good deal of caution. Trying to figure them out, Big Brother on the couch over an E4 now. On War 4, a relocation to a little-known part of Spain. Tom Hanks is in death row and award-winning the Green Mile over in film 4. And here on Channel 4, former Liberal leader David Steele discovers how his father was caught up in unrest during the last days of the Empire in Kenya. That's next.